Welcome, everyone, uh, to the second to last event of our SciCon US conference. Um, thanks for joining us this afternoon to hear some great speakers talk about cyber enabled influence operations. Um, I'm Dr. Erica, Ooh, there's a mic there. Um, I'm Dr. Erica Borgard. I'm an assistant professor at the Army Cyber Institute. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and you know, our, I, I'll, I'll leave it to our panelists to introduce themselves, but they all have a, uh, a, a wealth of experience and expertise on the top, topic of cyber-enabled influence operations. Um, before I get started, of course, just a brief disclaimer. The views that are expressed here are personal and those of the person expressing them and don't reflect the policy or position of uh, the Department of the Army, DOD, U.S. government, any um, uh, official entity that any individual may be associated with. So um, with that said, we'll get started with introductions and then, and then we'll start. Hi, I'm Major Justin Gorkowski, uh, currently a PhD student at the University of Virginia. I've uh, been an information operations officer since about 2008. Uh, last information operations related job was in Kandahar, Afghanistan, where I managed all information related capabilities. Hey, good morning, everybody. I appreciate everybody braving the weather to see your second to the last panel. Um, I'm Brian Mellon. Uh, I started my career as an infantry officer, did all those jobs up to uh, Battalion S3, and then became an FA30. Uh, my information operations jobs included uh, being a brigade information operations officer. Uh, I worked at the ASC ASCC level at RCENT and the GCC level at UCOM. And I'm currently the first information operations commander at Fort Belvoir. And I've been in command for about six months. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Colonel Fred Dixon. Similar to Colonel Mellon, I um, start off, I start off armor, but I was branch detailed military intelligence. And I became an FA-30 information operations officer when I was assessed into major. My first I.O. job was as a brigade I.O. for 2nd second, second Brigade, 1st Ar uh, Armored Division, and that was in, in Iraq, in, I guess that was MND, MND Baghdad. After that, I was on the USER staff, and I was the Deputy G39 and the OPSEC planner. After that, I was in 1st I.O. I was the Battalion S3 for 1st Battalion, and I became the Brigade S3 followed on by going to 8th, uh, 8th Army in Korea as the G7 officer, and now I am the, the new Chief of Strategy and Policy for Damal CY in the Pentagon, for um, Headquarters Army. Great, well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, to give you a sense of sort of what the plan is for this afternoon, um, I will be facilitating what I hope will be a lively and thought-provoking conversation about cyber-enabled influence operations. Um, and, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A uh, from the audience. And so just to kind of situate ourselves in sort of the theme of this conference, more broadly, not just this panel, um, we've, we've all been hearing a lot recently about um, information operations. Only a week ago, um, I read that in the uh, lead up to the 2018 midterm elections, Facebook blocked the accounts of 155 users. Um, in response to information from U.S. authorities that they were actually linked to foreign actors as part of an influence campaign to undermine the midterms. Um, so, of course, this is only one facet of cyber-enabled influence operations or information operations. Um, and so over the course of this afternoon's discussion, what I'm hoping to do is have a conversation across the tactical, tactical operational, and strategic levels of analysis about I.O., um, and in, in keeping with the theme of the conference, while IO certainly plays an important role in the context of outright warfare or hostilities, I'm hoping this conversation can stick to IO in the context of below the use of force threshold. Um, so what I'd like to do is kind of start off with some definitions, uh, particularly for those of us in the room who may, um, you know, not be entirely clear on the boundaries of of I.O. and what it means. So my question to the panelists is, how would you define I.O.? Um, and in particular, what is the difference between I.O. in general and cyber-enabled I.O.? We can start by the doctrinal definition. And the doctrinal definition, um, to summarize it, it says the use of information-related capabilities in military operations to help the commander achieve his objectives, which is to achieve, I want to make sure I say it right, 
to make sure that a um, commander achieves advantage over an adversary. I would caveat that to say that he needs to be able to achieve that in space and time for a certain space and time. Because the longer you try to extend an operation, unless you have it clearly detailed out, you can, affect, you can achieve those advantages only for a certain amount of time before the environment actually comes up and it supersedes what you're trying to get after, unless you've changed the objective. So how to make a military commander succeed in a military operation? Yeah, I, I, you know, a lot of people, when they, they throw around the term information operations, treat it as a thing, um, you know, break out the IO cannon, if you will, like it's, it's a, a warfighting system or, a, you know, something of that nature. It is a more of a function as far as synchronizing and integrating information-related capabilities in time and space in support of the maneuver commander's plan. And so you're, you're not, um, and I'll, I'll back that up a little bit by saying that an IO officer also should be um, an expert in MILDEC and OPSEC. And that's what they bring to the fight, is that expertise. But what we really bring to commanders on the battlefield and to the enterprise as a whole is our ability to, to synchronize and integrate all the information-related capabilities, whether that's the core information operations functions of, um, you know, think MISO, uh, MILDEC, OPSEC, or um, the related such as uh, PSYOP, uh, I'm sorry, such as... Um, um, Public affairs. Public affairs, thank you. <laughs> Public affairs, any, uh, strategic communication, all those things that might t touch the information realm. And I think um, CNO was a core information-related capability, but because it gained such prominence and everybody recognized that it's so important in today's day and age, it really caught fire and it became the focal point. Um, whereas in our mind, an information operator's mind, that is one of the IRCs that we synchronize and integrate for the plan. Now, if I can unpackage that just a little bit. You know, IO has progressed over, over time. And as Brian alluded to, at first we had five what we considered to be pillars for IO. But through operations, we realized almost anything you can bring to the fight can be interpreted as an information-related capability. Physical attack is an information-related capability. It creates an information impact in the battlefield. So rather than rely on what we call those pillars of I.O., we've expanded that to acknowledge that depending on the operation that you're working on, any capability that can be brought to the fight can be used into, um, in terms of information operations. Yeah, to me, it depends on who you're talking to. So these gentlemen have presented a very clear picture of what I.O. looks like in DOD, and even that's not commonly agreed upon. Um, you know, it's different between the joint services and, and the individual uh, services. Uh, escalate that, you know, one level higher to the interagency realm, and, and you're on a whole different sheet of music. So um, I, I think that it's important to under, understand that, that underlying logic and how DOD views information operations, but really what we're talking about here is influence. You know, how are we trying to influence the adversary uh, to change their behavior? And for us, from an expeditionary warfare, warfare mindset, it, it really is focused on changing behavior. So how are we going to influence the adversary to change their behavior to something that's more amenable to what we would like to see or to not do something uh, as well? Uh, at, at the DOD level, you know, information operations, we really don't have any uh, dedicated assets, very few occasionally. Um, so our function is really that of an integrator. We're trying to integrate these separate capabilities into something that would influence the adversary to, to do something we want them to do. Uh, from, from a cyber standpoint, you know, how has cyber changed information operations? I, I think that one of the key things to, to keep in mind is that cyber is another conduit. You know, we, we've done I.O. for decades through radio wave and, and leaflet drops and, and these types of things, but um, cyber represents another realm where, where we can influence the adversary to change their behavior. I guess I have a follow-up to that. Is there something unique then about cyber as a medium compared to other means of, um, a means of um, achieving IO objectives? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so cyber enables instantaneous response. You know, it's a, 
It enables a push button type of uh, capability that we can instantaneously, instantaneously transmit to, to a more significant number of recipients than ever before. Um, so it's exponified our, our, our ability to transmit messages um, and, and perhaps also increased our ability to measure how those messages are being received. If you look at the uh, internet, internet propagation rates across the globe, I mean, just exponentially increase every year. And, you know, our own kids all day long staring down at their devices. Like Justin said, we were able to reach them uh, almost real time. And that's powerful. I mean, that having that conduit that people are tied into is, is extremely powerful. But it doesn't take away from the whole effort of, and the power of harnessing everything that we have at our disposal um, to kind of bring a unity of effort beyond just cyber. I mean, cyber should be a component of it, a huge component, because of that, um, how, how much it's, uh, it's changing the world. But um, I think it's to take away from like a billboard or the radio or TV, that's still a powerful medium as well. Right. I guess I wanted to follow up on your, um, your discussion of the definitions of I.O. because what I noticed is that they all seem to be about I.O. in a war fighting context, right? Um, but you know, in the context of strategic competition between adversaries in cyberspace, we're not in a context of outright hostilities, right? Um, so how is I.O., how can we conceive of I.O. below the use of force threshold? What? And, and do we have the doctrine, right? Like, is our doctrine um, uh, conceptualized to... So right now, we, we talk about that kind of in shaping operations, right. but we know that we have to go by, with, and through partners and other uh, interagencies, Department of State in phase zero, um, kind of owns the ground, and anything that we would do, we'd have to go through them um, and through our partners. But I think... Uh, you know, everybody will agree that our adversaries don't really phase war like we do. Um, they kind of see themselves at war now, and they've weighed in, and um, we have to address that in the future. How do we break down those boundaries, and how do we work better with our partners in interagency to get after what you're talking about? Yeah, you've highlighted a, a key distinction between uh, Western information operations and, and our your peer adversaries, you know, the, the Russians specifically and the Chinese, you know, they, they do not use I.O. solely for military purposes. And that's, that's the posture that we have taken as the United States for, for since its existence. Um, Russia uh, specifically uses um, their military to, as, a, as a part of their information operations. So part of, part of the, the problem that you've highlighted is the need for a change in the paradigm. You know, we, we, we need to uh, escalate this to, to higher levels and, and completely change the way that we approach it in, in order to compete with near-peer adversaries in this space. Uh, oh, go ahead. If I can say one of the things that we just hit on, we talked about Russia and we talked about China as these monolithic things. And then we talk about what we as the military do for information operations. It requires a whole of government approach from regardless of what nation we're talking about. If they want to at a at the level that we're talking about, if we want to provide, if we want to have information impact, whether it's the different things you see, different mediums, the presence posture that China has, the operation, the um, social media, the things that you see, that's not just one aspect of the government. For the military, we support the, what we use as a whole of government approach. But we are only one part of a requirement for information operations at the national scale. So it requires the synchronization of efforts with the other departments. And if we want to actually um, prosecute a plan and to make sure we have the right sensors out for assessing what we're doing. And I th think that drives us to and I'm talking problems here, but that drives us to being very risk averse and very slow and deliberate. As we know, our adversaries, that's where they best us is they're very quick. And, um, you know, they know we follow the rule of law and they don't necessarily have to uh, abide by those, um, those conditions that we set for ourselves.
So I, I have a question kind of along a different track, which is um, based on sort of your personal experiences and your careers, you've seen IO sort of developed and evolve, develop and evolve over time, both in terms of you know, adversary IO and maybe our own um, IO. What can you identify some sort of key, um, what were sort of key inflection points or moments in history or in your careers where you saw some decisive change in the nature of IO and the impact of it? Um, and, and, and what do you think the implications of those sort of historical inflection points are? I can't say there's one specific thing you can point to. It's sort of like that boiling the frog analogy. If something were to happen right away, we could see, okay, there was the point. But over the past, you look at 20, 25 years, there's been an explosion of what I see as three things. First is the explosion of cyber connectivity, where we now have the, mean, the access and the means to affect automation remotely. And we don't have to go that, do that directly. We can go through different proxies. We have to do the local. Where the attack comes from or where the, the effect comes from is not necessarily the place you'd like to see it or you thought it would come from. The second is the explosion of social media. Now, I know we talked a little bit about the influence and we talked about cyber in terms of social media, but those are two separate things. Social media, as we see it now, is dependent on the explosion of cyber, of the, of the cyber environment. And the other thing that I see is just the raw accumulation and the ability to save data. And when I look at data specifically, if you look at, from, um, you look at an OPSEC or a MILDEC standpoint, the ability for someone to go back and find information that may or may not counter the effects that you're trying to get after. If someone's successful in finding information that disputes what you're getting after, that has a potential, that puts your information operation at risk. So those three things, the explosion of technology, social, um, social media that's, um, that's enabled by technology, and the um, exponential growth of information and access to information are the three things that I think are most important in shaping how we do we uh, prosecute IO now and how we see it um, being prosecuted in the world. Two examples that come to mind um, where really I saw our enemy being very successful and um, our adversary being very successful and there, there are two Russian examples so as uh, the invasion of Crimea um, and then the 2016 elections. Um, I mean just masterful and how they prosecuted a whole of government, you know, across uh, our construct, dime. I mean, hit every lever possible to, to prosecute. Um, what they were trying to do with the elections is just cause chaos in America, and they are highly successful. And that was using cyber, um, other arms uh, such as uh, um, uh, radio and TV through RT and... Um, What's the radio station? Sputnik. Sputnik. I mean, it's pretty interesting to me that I can go on my cable channels and turn on, turn on the TV and flip through a couple channels and hit RT. And in a very nuanced way, the Russians can have story after story. And they don't come out and say, America's terrible. But if you watch it for the entire, you know, two or three hours, at the end of the day, you're like, this place is a mess. And, and they figured out how to do that using, you know, young, um, very American uh, folks to read this, this news that's very nuanced, that doesn't come out and say it, but at the end, the, the takeaway is that we're terrible. And they, they do that on Sputnik as well, um, just by the folks that they bring on. And it tends to be the worst examples of our society on both extreme um, ends of the political spectrum. And... Uh, you know, and then with their cyber efforts. And if you put that all together, it's just masterful. And they've, they've done an outstanding job. So what are the lessons we've learned then from our adversary's success? So I, I think the lesson is that, um, well, first of all, my boss, uh, General Fogarty, I mean, he says you have to sense, understand, decide, and act. Um, and he uses the 2016 election as an example. He says... 
did anybody pick up that they were doing this? And if so, would they have been heard? If somebody had raised the red flag and said, this is going on, would anybody have cared? I think now we care. We, we're at the point where we understand what is being done to us. Um, are we going to get past all these, these um, things that we've done to ourselves that limit our ability to um, decide and act? I think that's where we're at right now. And we're getting better day by day. <coughs> I think another lesson is, you know, we've realized uh, as a nation that information operations is not just a military thing. This has become a very real thing that can influence all elements of national power. Um, uh, the, looking at some key inflection points, though, from uh, kind of an inside looking out perspective, I think in the last five years, you've really had some increased recognition within the leadership, not just DOD, but interagency leadership and, and recognizing what from our standpoint, information operations can do to support national power um, and relative power. And then, you know, looking at it exogenously, I think that um, we've come to the very clear understanding that the adversary is a real near peer or in some cases superior. Uh, we, have, we have many significant capabilities uh, individually that are very, uh, that are probably superior uh, from the U.S. standpoint, but collectively uh, from an external standpoint, the adversary now is on par with us. And, and where we used to have kind of an asymmetry in terms of relative power, uh, the scales are, are, are in balance or perhaps balanced in the adversary's favor now in the information domain. So that realization, I think that inflection point's happening now. Uh, we're aware of it, especially with the elections uh, in 2016. It's kind of a, a, a capstone effort on the adversary's part uh, I think that the, the learning is, is happening and, and we're making strides in the right direction. When you talk about um, sort of our adversaries being sort of near peers or peer or even superior, um, are you, do you mean that only in the context of I.O. or more broadly? Yeah, I'm speaking specific, specifically in the context of influence, information warfare from their standpoint. Um, but, but again, their information warfare supports their other elements of national power. So. Uh, you, you can't necessarily uh, disentangle them very easily. But if you look at their, you might have said this, but each of their information-related capabilities, they're, they're not all that great. Their power is in how they synchronize and integrate those seamlessly. Um, and I think in, until we can do something similar, they're going to be above us. Would you also say that the power is in some of the risk-taking, too? Not just in the integration, but in the willingness to take risks, to maybe be willing to make mistakes and be messy and, you know, and... and well, as Carl Mellon said, one of the advantages, if you want to... One of the advantages that our near peers have is they have that unity of effort in the government. This is what we're going to dedicate our focus on, and we can and we will align all of our elements against that. We have interest and we have... The United States has interest in different regions that sometimes don't allow us to be quite as focused. The other, make sure I say this the right way, is the two near peers that we discuss have histories of aligning as a society in one direction. We have one leadership hierarchy that says this is what we're going to do and the rest of the nation and different resources for it tend to align. Younger nation, and we are very, um, our diversity doesn't necessarily allow us to do that. So we have one side, which is we've done this for thousands of years. As a society, we're groomed in this way to respond as opposed to um, very diverse, different actions, different interests at different times that we represent. Colonel, <clears throat> Colonel Dixon brings up a good point. You know, none of our, None of our adversaries, who we think of as traditional adversaries, are liberal democracies. Um, you know, we're faced with certain constraints, and, and we're, we're actually almost fighting with different weapons uh, in the information domain. Uh, they, they are able to exploit vulnerabilities that are just characteristics of liberal democracies that we cannot reciprocate. We can't, we can't attack in the same fashion. So uh, there's an imbalance for sure in that regard. And the, the way that we use I.O. has to be innovative and, and, and try to figure out ways to uh, limit the ability, their ability to take advantage of those characteristics. I also think it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, after World War II, we were in Germany. We were in the Fulda Gap. 
And the way that we were going to defeat the Russian horde militarily was we were working off intent and with superior technology. Come to today's day and age, um, they totally, in the information space, work off intent. And I, I, I firmly believe they just say cause chaos in America or whatever line of effort they put forth and they unleash their folks who know that's what they have to do and they just work off intent. We're still, it's the, the inverse is true of us. We have to ask for permission. Uh, we abide by rules. So when we can close that gap between those, those two, I think we're going to be better off. And I'm not saying that we want to do necessarily nefarious type things or we want to cash in our values. Um, but I just think we need to think about intent and allowing some mistakes, like you mentioned. Um, it's okay. Somebody did the wrong thing. We own up to it, and we move forward because I, they absolutely get caught all the time. They own up to it. They're like, yeah, hey, we did that, and then they're off to the next thing. Or they just don't up to it. Don't right. own up to it. They just it, deny even it, we and all they know move on. That, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so pulling on this thread a little bit about, you know, democratic constraints and rule of law and authorities on the one hand and adversary capabilities and perhaps lack of constraint on the other hand, um, you know, how do we navigate that? And do we have the ability to have the kind of force structure that we need within existing authorities? Um, you know, one, one example of this is the fact that, you know, according to U.S. law, military I.O. can't influence you know, U.S. citizens, right? Um, how do we conduct I.O. below the use of force threshold, right? So not on the battlefield. Um, now, let's make sure we understand. The military cannot conduct I.O. specifically targeting U.S. citizens. Well, it, now, right. When we do our planning, there is the, res there is the, the possibility of U.S. citizens receiving the information as long as we're not specifically targeting and when we do the the damage estimate for an, what we should do for we do for targeting we do a collateral damage estimate when we do a damage estimate as to what might happen we factor that in and we we bring that to the national authority so um, with mitigation risk measures we can move forward just we have to be deliberate in identifying the potential risk and then putting in the mitigations for it and there is the component through public affairs where I think it's very important to inform and educate um, the U.S. population. And that's not targeting them. That's not trying to influence them, but informing them what's going on and trying to inoculate them against uh, what the adversaries are trying to do. Yeah, so that was actually going to be my follow-up question, which is, you know, the, the challenge for democracies is not just um, the authority and legal framework in which the military and across the interagency, different agencies have to operate um, to achieve, deliver IO effects, but the susceptibility of our public writ large to adversary IO. So what, um, what measures from a sort of public education perspective um, do you think we can take to better, you know, educate, inoculate, the American public from adversary IO campaigns, almost like a, like a civil defense kind of um, framework or concept for, for IO? Uh, you know, it really starts in, in, um, from a structural standpoint, I think, um, on the United States part, um, both within DOD and, and outside of DOD, getting everybody on the same page uh, to, to a much higher degree than we are now, uh, it, to include Congress um, it, with regards to specifically, you know, authorities and authorizations. Uh, Congress can help tremendously in this regard. But getting everybody on the same page, and, and that includes our doctrine, you know, uh, as already mentioned, I think, uh, you know, the joint regulation for information operations is, is somewhat different than the Army regulation and having, uh, you know, not just common themes, but they are, they are the same and they are executed in the same fashion and everybody who is working in information understands that when we execute some sort of information related task uh, th that, that translates uh, seamlessly through the interagency and, and through the other elements of our, of our national government so everybody knows what types of effects might result uh, as, a, as a, you know, to see what comes out of that type of operation. So getting everybody on the same page from not just a lexicon standpoint, but also from a doctrinal standpoint, 
and then just peeling back the onion to go to go from there. Yeah, I would say simpler than that. Even is just educating the public. You know, here are some vignettes are on how you, you were trying to, or the our adversaries are trying to influence you. I mean, I, I think we all grow up with um, don't believe everything you read, um, but taking that a little bit step further or a couple steps further into today's um, world where, you know, you can look at a million different things and have different viewpoints, um, but the first thing that you read is not always right or the first thing that comes at you is not always right and, and challenge that. Think critically. Um, I think that's got to be part of our education system from, you know, the time you go to the first grade or preschool, you're you're talking about these things because our kids are looking at these devices in a cyber world, you know, from three years on up. And so I don't think if um, if we don't invest in that a little bit, we're allowing our population to be susceptible. I mean, the, the one stakeholder we haven't really talked about is also the social media platform, right? That um, that hosts this content. Um, you know, so we, we've talked about the military, the interagency, the Congress, the American public. Um, what about those, you know, what about those platforms that uh, host and, you know, enable the propagation of uh, really detrimental content that's, that's linked, to, uh, linked to adversary I.O. campaigns? We're getting back to kind of the, the news that, you know, <clears throat> most recent news from the, from the midterm elections. What's, how, how, do, how do they play a role in, in these, different, uh, these well, different questions? They're conduits. So going back to what Carl Mellon said, we still have a, a basic education responsibility to, we have to educate the public to stop and take a look at what it is you're listening to. You have to, if this seems outlandish, if this seems strange, go find a different source. We're already teaching this at the experimental level in some of the um, ed education systems in the public schools. I think it's Project Digital, Digital Literacy, where they walk the kids through how to take a look at a, da a news source. Is this fake news? If you can't find it in certain other, in at least two other true places, then you need to go back and question it further. So that education portion has to be there. We're doing a... We're doing a we're doing a good job in trying to work with social media platforms to be more aware of the content that uh, they allow to move forward. But with every technology, it seems like every time we have a new technology, what happens to it? Less than 48 hours after the first day it comes out, there's a way to exploit um, what it is for nef nefarious purposes. So we're always going to have to continue to work in order to try to expose those things. So rather than being adversarial with social media companies. We have to work with them and make sure they're understanding what we're trying to get after, not in a threatening way, but how their work in defending and helping us to identify fake news and these fake feeds help us with national security. We have to partner with them. Uh, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is one area I think that we're actually doing, uh, we're making uh, tremendous strides. You know, Mark Zuckerberg and Testimony earlier this year said, you know, we are in a in an arms race in the information warfare environment. Um, I think that the, that the the major social media companies are really contributing a, a hugely significant amount of time and resources to this to this problem, um, to the tune of billions of dollars for Facebook alone. So I think we're going to see a, a lot of uh, uh, significant efforts taken in the in the next year even. Um, where, where these types of uh, fake news campaigns lose some traction. But it, it is a cultural problem, you know. This is a cultural shift where we are trying to educate the population. And obviously we, DOD, are not going to do <clears throat> so much of that uh, American public education on, on what, what uh, fake news is and how to read between the lines. Um, it's, it's, it takes parents at home, mom and dad, you know, uh, making sure that kids understand that there's, there's value in backing up what you're reading with, uh, with research and, 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 and knowing what you're talking about. So I think that this is, you know, this is definitely a really long-term problem, but the social media companies are kind of falling in line, I think, in terms of what they need to do to move forward. 
get, getting back to your point earlier about the 2016 election <clears throat> um, and, and detection of adversary I.O. campaigns, right? I.O. is designed to be not seen, right, by the target. Mm -hmm. So um, can we, how can we improve um, detection of these campaigns and what might be some early warnings or indicators that um, you know we are we are becoming the targets or the victims of, of adversary IO and then what measures can we take to potentially thwart that before it becomes before it delivers its desired effect. So from a, a DOD perspective, um, I th I think we could invest uh, a lot more more into intel support to information operations and intel support to cyber um, it's a growth obviously um, it would be a growth effort um, from traditional intelligence operations uh, I, I think we have to invest in that if we want to do better because if we can't see them we can't sense we can't understand then then how are we gonna gonna fight it um, as far as the actual indicators, um, that it's really hard. That's that's one of the hardest things that we try to tackle is um, um, how do we even know that we're successful and we know we're doing it is very very hard. So when it's being done against us, that's when we know we're we're uh, we're against a pro. I mean, I think you just have to have some sense, but. But like I said, we've got to invest in Intel support to I.O. I think there's technical ways that we could figure it out. Um, and then, obviously, if we've got some folks that are um, uh, educated in that, in that field, maybe we'll do a better, bit better job. So how do we measure the success of our I.O. Our, of our IO campaign? How, how do we know we're, we're changing the behavior or perception of, of the adversary. So I'm going to talk about what I know. Um, <laughs> so we do measures of effects indicators. So um, for whatever we're trying to do, we'll say um, maybe do a poll and see how many people responded to what whatever effort it was. I mean, that's, that's one example. Um, and we try to align those measures of effectiveness against what is trying to be achieved in the plan that we're supporting, whether it be a campaign plan or whatever plan it is, and marry those up. Um, the problem with that, it's hard, and then sometimes it takes a lot of time to get, to get an answer to whether you were successful, and often we've moved on to something else. So it is a tough problem. Um, it's not something, I would say, if you're able to... Um, get to there, you're a definite professional. And I'm not so sure that our, our adversaries really even care to measure it. They know that if they throw enough things out there and it's all kind of working together, they're going to be successful. And we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how we get after measuring our effectiveness when I'm pretty certain they don't even care. Yeah, you know, uh, there is a lot of effort put into trying to measure uh, what, what really, at, at the end of the day, is something that's pretty intangible, you know, it, especially in the military, you know, we, we expect to measure effects, you know, you fire an artillery round downrange, does it destroy the target, degrade it, um, does it deny the adversary the ability to do something, we, we speak in terms of tactical tasks and in the information realm, uh, it, it, it's very much an intangible game. So. Uh, it, it's definitely a, a game of, of with a long time horizon. You know, we we may employ some sort of information operation that that we don't get effects uh, any any measurable effects on for years. Uh, you know, you it may be supporting uh, you know uh, elections in Afghanistan, for example, trying to get people to go vote. It, it's also difficult to try to determine was it the information that caused people to go vote, or was it the security environment, or what the enemy was doing. So. You know, all these things have to be taken into account and, and, and then throw in the mix a uh, changeover of personnel who, who initiated the information operation and then who's actually trying to measure it perhaps years later to try to determine if we're successful. Uh, I do think, though, that the cyber realm uh, is one area where measuring perhaps is a little bit easier um, because you're talking about digits, transmission of digits, and, and those can be measured uh, both incoming and outgoing. And I think that uh, 
algorithms can be written. We, we are already doing this, I'm sure. Algor algorithms can be written to detect something that is just uh, slightly off, especially uh, when measuring compared to uh, you know, factual information. Um, I, I think there's a lot of potential on the cyber realm to help in this regard and, and perhaps even kind of reinforce the other uh, domains we operate in. There's a difference between knowing that, I mean, it depends how you define success. Success can be defined as, well, we were able to, you know, carry out this mission, right, in a more sort of tactical or operational sense, like they got the message, right, um, versus we were able to influence behavior. No, we can't. Or perception, right? When, Which is, let's, let's unpack that a little bit and talk about measures of performance. We can say, let's go back to um, PSYOP, MISO. We can say we dropped a bunch of leaflets on an area. Right. The measure of performance is we did that. Right. The, measure of, the measure of effects indicators, um, we start to hear radio traffic that says the leaflets are being looked at this way, and maybe we say that leaders that we're able to identify are talking to other leaders, and we can develop networks that's proving that the measure of performance that we had is resonating in the environment. What does that translate into as far as whether or not we're successful? What was the intent behind that leaflet drop? If the leaflet drop intent was to tell people to stay away from a certain area at a certain time and no one goes there, okay. But if, um, what if the intent was just to generate the traffic? And that's why, that's when you start talking about information operations where it gets to be a little complex. What is the intent of the action that you're doing? Uh, Fred, why am I littering Baghdad with leaflets? Well, this leaflet is to carry this message across for this action, sir. This leaflet is to see what happens when certain people get the information there. This one is um, in order to reassure the populace that we are here and that we're taking actions for them. We're trying to change behaviors of target groups. So that's what information operation is supposed to be. It's not necessarily to make people feel happy, make people... It's to make certain target groups in a way that we're that um, that is ad, um, advantageous to us. Now, when we take a look, moving back to the topic here of during periods of competition, we can't necessarily say if I do this one thing, it's going to get after this. But what we can do is we can say here is a target audience, and by the way, that's something we have to become comfortable saying. If we look at information operations as trying to influence certain areas. We have to be comfortable as a military and as a whole of government using the word target, even though it might mean that we're talking about allies, partners. For a certain impact or effect we're trying to get after, whether it's through um, engagement, through media, we have to be comfortable with saying target. Um, <laughs> We have to make sure that once we identify that target, as Colonel Mellon said, we put enough operations or actions against that target so we can start to see a movement towards the effect that we're going after. And we will never find, when we start talking about competition phase, we won't find causation. If I can get to correlation, mm -hmm. I'm happy with that. But if anyone's expecting causation, or an immediate return on investment. Why did I spend so much money on this particular thing? If that's an expectation, then we really need to think about what we call a definition of success when it comes to conducting op um, information operations. Well, I wanted to ask one last question to, to you all before I turn it over to the audience for, for Q&A, and that's sort of looking ahead and thinking about the future. Um, you know, so we see things, technological developments like deep fake, <clears throat> right? Um, what are the implications of, of things like that for the future of I.O.? Where do you generally see um, the future of I.O. going? Two different questions, but they're, they're related. Um, I see information operations exploding. And the way I, I reason I say that is when you, just in the time that we've been information operation professionals, we have seen a realization among leadership that influencing and using the different conduits, the IRCs, 
is just as, and in some cases, more important than kinetic effects. So as we see that, and as we look at, the, at this competition phase where we want to influence a key leader in a different area not to take this action because of what he's seeing in the environment, and we're seeding that environment to get to that result, then we'll start to see, if we can seed properly, and we get the results, that will expound. Commanders will then begin to say, we need to bring more information operations, more of these sort of effects in, into the competition phase, so we don't have to necessarily rely on the physical. If we've gone to the physical, then we've already lost the information, the information fight. So I think uh, artificial intelligence, deep fakes, um, all these futuristic things that are here now are going to be huge within the information operations arena. Um, we, we need to be prepared because I know our adversaries are looking at them and they're going to use them in the future. Um, I, I, I see that as just being the future toolkit. You know, we, we evolve over time. Like Justin said, we started, you know, maybe with the radio or, you know, TV or it, it's just going to be that next um, level of how people receive information and how um, people could could possibly be um, influenced um, and whatever it's going to take to control those narratives and influence folks they're going to use that technology so I think we have to harness it for our own use for the use of good and then be prepared to defend against it against our adversaries do you think just as a follow-up do you think unbalanced the evolution of these kinds of technologies is to is more of a benefit to our adversaries or to, to us. I I think whoever owns the technical edge is going to have the advantage, and whoever can um, get through the cycle the fastest and use this technology to their benefit is going to have the advantage. Uh, I think I think no matter what, the adversary is going to have the advantage because the adversary is always going to have the ability to apply the technology in ways that we can't. Um, and that's one of the ways that, um, it, let me rephrase that, they're, go they're going to have the offensive advantage. Um, we, we may be able to emplace defensive measures to, to, to repel or to deter the employment of those capabilities, but I think that going back to our, our liberal democratic constraints, that the adversary is going to, to not hesitate in the employment of offensive. So I'm going to disagree a little bit because I think our our leadership is waking up to what they're doing. And um, I think that we're going to impose some red lines upon our enemy and hopefully um, hold them at risk and um, say, if you do X, you're going to receive um, something in turn. Um, so I don't think it's quite as bleak. Um, they, they will hold a little bit of an advantage, but um, I think if we own technology and then we can get past um, some of the self-imposed um, blocks that we've that that keep us from uh, working across inter interagency and across the DoD will be in a better place. There, there's tremendous potential for sure, um, and I think we're we're getting to where we need to go. The you know taking measures such as the emplacement of costly signals, much like yeah, we had uh, you know 300,000 uh, U.S service personnel near the Folded Gap during the Cold War as a tripwire, uh, Thomas Schelling, you know, we, the, the intent was not to have that, that element, that, that force stop uh, a Russia, a Soviet advance. It was a tripwire that would credi credibly commit the, the full resources of, of the Western world and, and specifically the United States to the conflict um, and, and served as a costly signal. So the Soviets knew that if that wire was tripped, you know, the U.S. was in. We need to do the exact same thing in the information domain. We need to emplace tripwires, uh, red lines, so and, and then clearly communicate those with our adversaries so they know that in the event those wires are tripped, there are real implications that may still not be um, kinetic, uh, but they may be economic, they may be um, political. Uh, something needs to, to be in place. I, I think this is where Congress comes in uh, predominantly, you know, I think that we're making strides in this regard. Congress is understanding this and, and multiple pieces of, of legislation have been advanced to try to address this specific problem, but it goes back to the nature of our, our, our free market society and 
uh, enabling economic freedom um, and, and the, the hesitancy to put constraints on that. So we, we will get there, I'm sure, I'm confident uh, from a legislative standpoint, but uh, without the emplacement of those tripwires, you, you know, there's, there's nothing really deterring adversary action in the information domain. Well, what's fascinating about your, I know I said it was the last question, but I'm the moderator, so I guess <laughs> to change my mind. Um, as your, the tripwire metaphor or, or um, analogy is, is, is fascinating to me because during the Cold War, the point of the tripwire, what, what made it so credible was that we were willing, that, was that, you know, we would not be able to stop the Red Army, right, from marching across Europe. And in Schelling's words, the point of the tripwire forces was so that they would die gloriously and publicly to invoke, um, to force the American public to um, you know, put pressure on the government to then bring to bear the full weight of our national capabilities. Um, it meant that we were willing to take risks and incur costs that would force us to respond with you know, the full weight of our, of our forces. So, so thinking about how, how we apply that tripwire analogy to the cyber domain, um, what, like, what would be that costly thing that we'd have to absorb that would force us politically to respond? I know we're kind of getting a little bit off, off track here, but I just, I just I found that striking because I, I, I have a hard time thinking about what, what that looks like and whether we're willing to put ourselves at risk, put our, ourselves at risk like that, right? You're exposed as a tripwire force, that's the point. Mm -hmm. You're constantly exposed and you're constantly at risk um, and, and you do that as a, as a credible signal. What does that look like here? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, perhaps somebody from the audience would like to answer. No, audience? You know, uh, I think it's gonna be in the economic and political realms for sure, um, and, and, and it's gonna have to do with coalitions and um, sanctions, you know, all the institutional mechanisms that, that can enforce these types of uh, tripwires, but it, it, it's a tough. It's a tough challenge. It's it's going to uh, take you know whole of government approach again um, and a multinational approach to try to address this. I think there are a lot of creative ways we can get at it. Um, it's just going to take a unified effort, and, and that's that's the key from the the United States standpoint is is unifying in our approach to these types of problems. Yeah, I think there's already been some politicians that have talked about the next election being possibly one of those things like that's our democracy that's off limits um, but are we willing to really make it a tripwire yeah I mean Dick Cheney said that that was an act of war uh, General General Mike Hayden has, has countered that and said you know that that's that's pretty dangerous the the problem is we don't understand exactly how exactly what the problem is you know is it a political problem is it an information problem is it a military problem uh, he, he's also said you know look at uh, this this may not be a cyber problem. Take it out of the cyber bucket and put it in the Russia bucket. This is a Russia problem, and address it from a, from a whole government approach in that in that perspective. Well, thank you all for your for your really insightful thoughts on this topic. I want to give the audience some time to weigh in and ask questions. So if um, if anyone has a, a question, yeah, right over here. Hi, thanks for the comments. Um, so you ended the discussion about whole of government and also Colonel Dixon mentioned unity of effort and how our adversaries seem to be very good at having a whole of government and unified effort. With regards to the Department of Defense, for example, if you look at counterterrorism, SOCOM conducts web operations in support of combatant commands to counter the influence of terrorist groups. Task Force Ares is part of Cyber Command, seems to have a similar or related mission to that. And then you have international players like Russia. With regards to unity of effort, would the Department of Defense benefit from having a operation, an operationally focused joint supporting commander for IO, information, counter information, choose your topic, to the combatant commands? Thank you. I would say thanks for that softball, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the world. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, so this is a major structural problem within information operations, DOD-wide, but specifically in the Army, you know, we, we call it the belly button problem. There's nobody, if, if Congress says, somebody from DOD, come tell me about information operations, who goes? Is it, is it cyber, EW, uh, Colonel Mellon as the only brigade commander in the Army for I.O.? Uh, it, it's a very confusing uh, structure, so. And have, we're land-centric, maneuver-focused, maneuver-led. Yeah. Um, yeah, detached so. from the training mission that you have. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think so. This putting is, in the right infrastructure and uh, would be amazing, as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Um, I I would say um, we've got a good start right now um, at, with with our cyber as far as leading the effort for uh, possible design of a. Um, information warfare construct. Um, I think that's a good beginning. And then we continue to spin off um, and maybe build it into the Army and then, like you said, up into the joint, joint staff. You know, we've seen Russia and even the UK have built information warfare brigades, uh, kind of similar to the structure with, with which you're speaking. Uh, you know, we've we've learned that having a standalone brigade is not not uh, not desirable. I, I think that no matter where you put it, you got to ensure you've got 100 percent of support from the command. So uh, this is a this is a problem that I think, unfortunately, is going to require probably Congress to to get involved and say, hey, look, DoD, you're going to do this. Where is the best place to put it? Um, come back to us with some solutions. I, I think that that's a, a very real and and relatively short-term reality that, that will probably happen anyway, but um, we've got some homework to do for sure to see where, where we can maximize utility. Hey, I'm a seaman. I'm with Facebook. Um, when we work on disrupting non-IO adversarial operations, of which there are also plenty, uh, there are always concerns about interfering with ongoing investigations or maybe any operations you might be conducting like tracking or maybe even contra interference. Is that a concern at all in the IO space that you have or you don't think that like a social media company can do too much in taking stuff down without maybe briefing other partners? As with any of the IRCs, I've always thought about we see something, do we go mitigate it right away? Yes, it's causing apparent damage immediately, but maybe we want to take a look at what that is. How do we exploit that and turn it back? So I think two things. We have to be able to quickly identify that vulnerability. And then we have to be able, because we have a plan or a thought about how we would, expo we would exploit that, we'd have to reach out and partner with the capability of the, the organization that found that and say, this is what we want to do. Now, what that would re require is coordination and partnership with industry to make sure that they are supporting our national interest as we're going after something. Now, granted, um, in industry, their bottom line is not necessarily support of truth, justice, in the American way. It's, bottom, it's the dollar bill. But still, we need to, I think we can do a better job of bringing them into supporting of our national interest. We get that partnership, academia, institutions, to help us work with that problem. And I think that we'd be able to incorporate their observations in the information environment and use those to support operations that the government develops. And whether it's the DOD that, in, that executes that or whether it's some other, other branch of the government, as part of a whole of government solution, that's secondary. But partnering with academia and industry to help identify and figure out how we can exploit what we, um, the vulnerability that we detected in the operation should be a priority for us to figure out. I hope I, did I get at your question? Or, oh. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Andy Whiskey Man, currently the senior cyber strategist at CENTCOM, just incognito for a bunch of other meetings. Thanks so much. I mean, I took like a whole page of notes. I think you could have a whole conference on just this topic and not just one, one discussion. Uh, I wanted to hit on two points, though, uh, and it's to take a bit of a contrarian view on a couple of things. 
One, I think it's almost dangerous to pull out information operations as something separate or have a separate command or a separate entity. Because the job of the commander is to defeat his adversary or her adversary, right? And so what we've done in some respects is make it seem like a some special person does that. I just handle the, the tough stuff of the blowing things up. But the whole intent of blowing something up is to get your adversary to change their behavior. And it's not a new problem. I mean, Napoleon marched all the way from Paris to Moscow, won every battle along the way, but how'd the war end up? He didn't get his adversary to quit. So are we in danger of doing something similar by outsourcing the aspects of the mental piece of warfare? That's first. And then second, as an observation, is, you know, I had a cyber-enabled breakfast today, right? Because I used a microwave that had a microchip in it. Like, there's a, there's a problem with cyber-hyphenating everything. There's a radio station in Hansville, Alabama, that uses shortwave, and it reaches Australia, Japan, and Russia with shortwave radio. So the reach of the information environment is not new, but I think we fall into the trap of thinking that somehow cyber is the new technology that's going to win things for us. We had a similar problem with air power at the turn of the last century. So do we fall into the trap of trying to find panacea solutions in technology to get after what is fundamentally a human contest of wills that belong with leaders and not outsourcing it? Thanks. So I'll answer the first part um, best I can. So when I first became an FA-30, um, coming from a maneuver background, having been an S-3 before, I did not understand it. I said, well, we're, we're synchronizing and integrating. Isn't that S-3 business? Why don't we just put all this stuff within the S-3's bin, a la uh, warfighting function that uh, the joint staff has just adopted. It, it becomes commander's business. I think the problem with that is there's so much going on um, within those maneuver commanders uh, as well as the S3. They're, what they're trying to command and control on a regular basis is just so much that when you add the information operations and all the IRCs on top of that, they just don't have the bandwidth to address it and they don't have the expertise. And so I'm not trying to be an S3 by an FA, being an FA-30 but I'm trying to help that S3 integrate and synchronize the information operation components into his maneuver plan or into the commander's plan or whatever plan it is. Um, and I, I do hope that the, uh, the, the Army follows suit with um, joint and uh, adopts information as a warfighting function. I think that'll be helpful. Um, but to your point, um, I don't think... Unless you have some kind of um, structure that, it, that that's out there, it's going to be constantly taken off the table if somebody doesn't have uh, their focus on the information environment. Um, and I just you know, I have some some scar tissue from this. Um, we live in a maneuver centric. Um, Army is land focused and maneuver centric focused, and our leaders come from. A, for the most part, from a, a maneuver background. So I don't know. Does that answer your question, Andy? Um, before before you ask, so you you've hit upon something that I'm sure whether Strike or not nerve. they want to admit it grates on every FA thirty, every IO person, and that is how do we make sure that we bring information operations to the level of intent of the commander's intention attention that it deserves because we understand that it's more than just that physical it's just that kinetic effect um i can't tell you the number of plans that i've seen where when it came down to the mission analysis and at the end of a three-hour skull session where no one's been allowed to go up and take a latrine break or anything like that it gets to the io slide major dixon what do you got eyes have glazed over and everything is, at this point, sir, I've got nothing. For, I've, I can take one of two tacks. Sir, let me come back to you based on the information we've given, or I'm going to exhaust you for the next hour to make sure that what, I'm said is, what I've said is heard. I'd been, if there's something I'd been successful in doing in my time on staffs is trying to make commander understand that when he puts out his, inf his um, commander's intent, 
that he articulates something regarding the information environment in his commander's intent. And I've also been fortunate enough to move up information operations early enough into that mission analysis to make sure that other people are starting to look at what we're getting after so they can alter what they're looking at. Going to cyber, addressing the cyber point, a um, couple of things in that. First, we have to understand it's a conduit. Air power was another way of conducting operations. Cyber is, I don't mean to belittle it, I don't mean to, it's a new flavor, it's a new domain. We have to figure out how to operate within that domain. It doesn't necessarily, it can't win things in and of itself. It's a, what, something we have to harness in order to move forward. We have to make sure that people understand that cyber is a conduit. And when you talk about cyber, there's, there's layers of it. There's the internet of things. The microwave you talked about, um, from, my, from your phone, you can activate that microwave. How do I interrupt that space in order to get, um, to get some sort of effect that I want to get after? We have to understand that there's multiple layers when we're talking about cyber and ultimately how we manipulate within each of those multiple layers within cyber to get after the effect of the command mm -hmm. point. Yep, did touch a nerve because like I said, several of us have grown over generations of IO and we've seen how things, some of the trouble that we've had in getting after them. I mean, I, I think in a perfect world, if we trained our, our operations officers and our commanders to think about uh, using information operations, really, would we necessarily have a job? I mean, we would do the, the mill deck component, maybe the offset component of it. But um, I mean, where I've, I've made my money in my career is synchronization and integration and bringing in all the IRCs and allowing the commander to bring those to bear in the time and space where he, you know, where we feel like it's going to do the complete the mission. Yeah, I think uh, you're, you're both kind of talking on the same wavelength. You know, it's, it's going to require a balanced approach, whatever it is. There are definitely some challenges that, that you made a very good point of, of pulling I.O. out and making it its own thing. Um, you know, I, we may see some of that in the cyber realm as well, but it's got to, it's got to come from both directions. But kind of the, I think the pressing concern right now is that there, there is no, getting back to the belly button problem, you know, there's nobody... Uh, to, to point to and say, hey, uh, who's the expert in I.O. And, and where do we go? That, that establishment of some sort of information warfare entity, I think, would help in that regard. Um, it, it, if commanders were, you know, completely fluent in this, in this space, absolutely, we wouldn't need folks uh, as part of the ranks. But I, I think the reality is that that's not the case, and we need to kind of attack it from multiple directions. Good afternoon. Phil McGuinn with the NDU College of Information and Cyberspace. The question today is, it's been two years since the strategy for operating in the information environment came out, a year since information is, uh, was elevated to a joint function. What challenges and opportunities do you see of that going forward and what's come down in the last year or so that may be affecting how y'all are looking at training or operating, how that's working through. If you don't like that one, I'll give you an option question. Um, and that's looking at um, defense strategy talks, it's a very brief piece about uh, the battle of the narrative, and it always sets it as a counter narrative, affecting the adversary, going back against them. What do we have that's positive to go against the cognitive space and work through, and how have y'all addressed that in your uh, opportunities in the past to look at narrative? I think I'll talk to the first one, or excuse me, the second one, because I see some furious pin scrubbing on the other. The, what you don't see, because it doesn't, because the American public is not the, um, the target audience for it, is the interactions that we do with our, with our partners. Um, you know, we host international partners in our service colleges. Um, we educate them, they go back to their countries and they show, they integrate how we conduct operations. We keep in contact with them. We keep them informed through forums, through magazines. We do tremendous outreach every time our soldiers go forward into the different theaters. And that is information that we amplify within those theaters and resonates. If you're all familiar, I'm sure people are familiar with the, um, with Pacific Pathways where we start a unit that's going to a rotation in the Pacific. And after they do, in 
they do several rotations, doing stopping at several ports, participating exercises. We, USERPAC and PACOM does a good job of, of amplifying the things that they're doing in that region in support of those partners. It's local, so you don't see it. A lot of the things that we do, we're the military, we're focused out. We don't necessarily bring that back to the, to the American public. So we are out and we are, from a strategic messaging standpoint, we are um, very active in that. Like I said, you just don't see it. So for the other question, didn't you? Um, yeah. Did I get after that or? Okay. Yeah, I think also, um, I mean, we were wildly successful, I think, after World War II. You think of Radio Free Europe and Liberty. Uh, broadcasting Board of Governors of getting out, you know, what America's values are and juxtaposing those against um, the adversaries um, and winning that narrative. And I, and I think those those fundamental American values still sell very well. And um, I don't think the American public really sees us doing that because, like Fred said, they're not our target audience. Um, our target audience is the adversary public population or those that are in between. Um, so I think that's still, you know, freedom, justice, uh, blue jeans, rock and roll. I mean, those are all things that, that people seem to, to gravitate towards and think of as a good thing. And I think that helps us win the narrative. You know, that is another area that we didn't talk about at all. We talked about us versus them, but that gray space, um, not gray space, our allies and our partners. We have to be sensitive to the fact that the things that we say or do in the information environment affect them. Um, it, directly in, it directly influences their will to support operations that we do. Um, there is an expectation that when they need assistance, we'll go to them. So if they are targeted for information, uh, information operations for a certain extent, how are we going to respond to them? So as we get after that, what we try to do is we try to bring them in, we try to educate them on information operations to the extent that we can. And we look at sharing relationships for some of the information related capabilities to try to create transparency so that we can work together. So that as a, co as a collective, we um, form a, a better defense against, um, against information operations pushed at um, our partnership. So unfortunately, we're out of time for this afternoon, but I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists for sharing their thoughts and insights with us. And please don't forget, there's one more final panel um, right across the hall at 4 o'clock. So thank you very much. Thank you.